light and um, CO2 levels and uh, just to sort of catch up things. On the, what, some of you had, wanted to, had asked me at the beginning of the semester about supplementing CO2. So there'll be a couple of lectures where there's like two or three different topics, sort of like a summary of, of different things. So today we're going to do a one hour lecture or one 50 minute lecture, whatever, on what is, used to be a course that you could take, which is plant growth and development. I don't even know if we offer that. Do we offer plant growth and development here, period? That was a standard course that uh, anybody in plant sciences, not botany, but anybody in plant science would take. It was a uh, you know, full semester course, but you know, we, it's been completely replaced, I guess, more with molecular than anything, which is too bad. But um, it's very important, and you get bits and pieces of it, of course, in other courses. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we measure growth, which is important. A little bit about seed uh, development and germination. And we're going to end up with senescence and program cell death. And I'll probably have you read something about program cell death uh, on your own. Now, Plant development, like all development, is an entire series of very complicated, highly controlled events. To go from a single cell to an entire plant. And um, of course it's genetically programmed. And I've told you several times that usually by the time, at least in corn, which is basically the only thing I know about development is corn, is by the time the corn plants, say, a foot tall, almost all the cell divisions have occurred. Uh, the cells have already been faded. Anybody, anybody had animal development by any chance? We talked about the bat. You, know, you go to the bat blastula stage, and then he goes into the gastula stage, and by the time all those cells have turned inside out, then the embryo is faded. So a, a given cell will always develop into part of a given organ. So the same thing with a plant. By the time the plant's foot tall, if you start taking it apart, you're going to be able to see incredibly small what will, cells that will develop into the ear, that will develop into the tassel. And most of the growth, and we'll be talking about this when we talk about auctions, is about from the time it's that foot tall till it gets to be six feet tall. So just cell expansion. And then once the cells have expanded and the corn plant is, or whatever plant is six feet tall, then the ears finish developing, the tassels finish developing, then we have that last, last round of, of, of meiotic divisions to produce uh, the egg cells and the sperm nuclei. Okay, so um, very complicated. We don't understand a lot about plant development. Like I said, we know a lot, we know a lot more about how we can move DNA into a plant. We can basically move DNA into any organism that we want. We just don't know what DNA to move around. So. We really can't improve development until we understand development. So what is development? It's all the changes that a cell undergoes. Um, plant cells, and we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, plant cells are, are uh, have something that we're just now starting to understand in animal cells, that you can take a plant cell and you can pretty much develop anything out of a plant cell. Each plant cell can fairly easily be turned into another plant. Uh, we can't do that with many other organisms. That we're just now in animal development beginning to understand how we can do that, and that's pretty important. Growth is very specific. Growth, when we talk about plant growth, we're talking about irreversible 
changes in, in something. Cell number, size, volume, uh, and it's irreversible. So a six-foot plant is not going to turn into a two-foot plant. And then growth can be measured in a lot of different ways. We're going to talk about them. We can talk about fresh weight and dry weight. If we look at how everything grows, plants, bacteria, is you have this initial sort of a lag phase where things are basically getting primed, then you have this very, very quick growth. Then that growth slows down and we get into the stationary phase. Now, we can look at change in volume. So, next lecture, we're going to talk about how auxins cause cells to elongate. And if you put that together now, the force that drives the cells to elongate, what's the force that causes those cells to elongate? What is actually pushing the cells, cell walls to separate out and make the cell longer? What force? Water, turgor pressure, okay? So turgor pressure pushes that. Change in fresh weight, change in dry weight, change in cell number. It's something that we can quantitate. And I want to come back to this in a second. And uh, my, actually, when I took plant growth and development, it had a lab with it, and we had to actually measure growth. And if we look at where things grow, growth velocity, position from the tip, guess what? Maximum growth velocity is, if you remember from lecture one, is that, cell, that area of maturation, of elongation, where the cells are actually below the meristem. So the meristem is pushed up because turgor pressure causes those cells to expand below the meristem. So the meristem keeps being pushed up, or it keeps being pushed down if it's the root meristem, because turgor pressure and hormones are causing those cells to expand behind the meristem. Relative uh, growth rate, same thing. Elemental growth rate, that's just a measure of growth. And then, so what do we measure? Okay, um, depends on what you're doing. If you're, a, if you're growing a crop, and let's say you're doing something like looking at different fertilizer rates, you could look at time to flowering or look at how tall the plant gets with the different fertilizer rates. But probably you're going to be looking at yield because that's really... If you're growing a crop, that's really what you're interested in, is the final yield of the crop. So it depends on why you're doing the experiments. Now, there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of people like me, uh, that maybe are looking at just plant development. So we're not really looking to increase yield. We're looking at see how things affect plant growth, and it could be anything the number of leaves, uh, the number of fruit, anything like that. Uh, and we can, we can measure all these different parameters. Biomass, if you're, if you're looking at tomatoes, your biomass really would be the, the amount of weight of tomato that you're producing, probably. Though if it's, if it's just strictly pure science, we might cut the plant off at the ground level and put that plant in a dryer, dry it down, and measure the entire dry biomass, not just the fruit. We may take the fruit, put those in one bag, put the leaves in another bag, measure anything above the soil level, level or we may take the roots, and you've seen a lot of people do this where they're looking at root uh, biomass or root area and you pull the roots out carefully and you wash all the media from the roots and then um, Dr. Volder used to do this. 
you can put the root on a scanner and there's a program then that looks at the root and you can, you can calculate not just the mass of the root, but the root geometry to see if, an, see if a treatment causes the root to spread out more or something. So we can look at all these things. Yield, if you're trying to market something, then you're probably going to look at yield at what you want to put on the market, tomatoes, whatever. Now let's talk about some uh, terms. We usually have cell division and cell enlargement, and then we have this process called differentiation, which is very, very important. Differentiation refers to changes in the cells, tissues, and organs other than size. So differentiation is a cell dividing, and then that divided cell then starting to differentiate into a specific cell type. Okay? So depending on where the cell is, what, where it is in the plant, and if you think about when we'll, we'll talk about next time, is in plants we have all these hormones plus other compounds that are hormone-like. So in any place in the plant, in any position of the plant, you've got all these factors that are going to have different concentrations. And so at a certain point in the plant, if it's in the middle of the plant, and depending on what all these conditions are, that cell may start differentiating into a phloem, into phloem, or into xylem, or it may start becoming a leaf cell, okay? There's a lot of factors, most of which what we do not know determines what these cells will do. Now, in plant cells, we have a very important process called dedifferentiation. So I can take some plant cells and I can put them in media and from these cells I can usually get something called a callus. This is a callus. These are basically undifferentiated cells growing in a petri dish. And then I can take these cells and then by changing usually the hormones or the concentration of sugar in the media or whatever, I can make these things re-differentiate. And if you look right here, you see this little darker green part? If you look at that, this is actually some shoot starting to grow out of this mass. And, and some of you may have worked with callus tissue. So this is something that's fairly unique to plants is that we can then take these shoots, grow them up, take the shoots, put them back into media, and then they'll de-differentiate into this callus mass. And callus is basically undifferentiated cells. And the ability of plants to do this, to revert to the embryonic state, once they have differentiated, is called totipotency, okay? And this was done in 1958, shown in 1958 uh, by uh, Vilma Vasile, who actually taught me plant growth and development. No, her husband did. Uh, and so this was, uh, this was a big thing. Because now we can take a full cell and we can make other things out of it. Yes, sir? How do, how, do, how do you de differentiate the cells? Um, the, you take the tissue, and you can take, you know, uh, just a small piece of tissue, and you put it in a defined media. It's, you know, this has auger in it, and it's probably going to have some kind of a auxin in it. And then these cells then start growing. And I think I've got one down in here, when, what happens, well, I think that's when the auxins, and you can also see this in a plant. Uh, it's easy to see in a, a mint plant. If you very carefully take a razor 
and you cut the corner, mints are square, so you cut the corner, so you cut, you know, cut a piece down and out of the corner, you're cutting through the vascular tissue. Then if you very carefully look, you'll actually see in that, that empty space, the hole, you'll start to see this kind of tissue grow. And then from this tissue, the xylem and phloem will re-differentiate. So after a period of time, the plant has regrown that xylem and phloem. And it, it it's all has to do with wounding, which causes hormones to be produced. Uh, which causes a change in the concentration, not just the hormones, but a lot of other things. And so we can just keep doing this over and over again. And in fact, with totipotency, what, what Vilma did was she actually took single cells. So she took this callus culture, and you can take a callus culture and you can put this on a shaker with liquid media, and it'll start producing small, bit, small bits of cells. And she was able to isolate single cells, and from a single cell, see it redifferentiate into an entire plant. Now, we know that we basically, most organisms, that every single cell has the DNA, the same DNA. So every single cell has a capability of producing an entire organism. Uh, we can just do it a lot easier in... Uh, in, in plants, and here we have that callus put into uh, a different, here you can see the shoots being uh, developed, okay? This is very, very controversial in animals. Anybody know why this is such a controversy? No, no, so it's something, what's, what's a real, real thing right now? Anybody ever heard of a stem cell? Yeah. Stem cells are cells that can that had the capability of differentiating into any other kind of cell tissue cell. And still stem cells are only found for the most part uh, in embryos, which means stem cells, if it's human embryos, then that gets into all the politics and everything. Uh, and so there's the, the work in stem cells has been greatly reduced. Uh, and so a lot of work now is going into finding that secret, the secret sauce, where we can take some cells, human cells, and then turn them into stem cells. And that's, uh, there have been reports of that. There's one very famous, uh, recently a, uh, a Japanese lab reported that they could treat cells with acid with a weak acid for half, a, half an hour or so, and then they would become stem cells. Well, it may turn out that, that was all BS. It's a big scandal uh, because this lab produced a lot of papers. You know, and again, if you're going to fake stuff, don't fake curing cancer or <laughs> making plants fix nitrogen or something. You know, if you fake something like that, you're going to be found out really quick. And people started looking at it. And pictures they had published, they, could, they show that some of the pictures was, were from other papers. It was, it's, it's a real mess, because now they say they did it, but now no one knows what they did and what they didn't do. Why is this important? You know, we're right at the point of, you know, we can make organs. The people have had, right now it's like cartilage, so you can have cartilage grown and transplanted. Um, Yeah, if, yeah, you repair nerves. Um, yeah, right, redifferentiating things that we can't redifferentiate. Um, recently, a few years ago, this guy got an idea about how organs are made. So he went out and got a dot matrix printer, a dot matrix printer cleaned out the ink, you know, and, and, and the way, uh, you know, they work is they shoot out a little tiny piece of ink of different colors. You have, a, you have an ink cartridge that has different colors. And he took all the ink out and he put cells in there and he was able to print out organs. 
with a dot matrix printer, not complicated organs, but he was able to print out working groups of cells, uh, which was a real breakthrough because that was just too easy to be believed. Okay, now we can go down here and we can talk about where all this stuff comes from, which is the meristems. And we have two apical or primary meristems that you know in the shoot and in the root. In that um, they then produce the primary growth. And the primary growth is the growth behind the root and the shoot meristems that give rise to the zone of elongation, zone of maturation. And the, the tissue is called the primary tissue as opposed to in woody plants where we have a vascular cambium that produces secondary tissue. And where the primary tissue will, will say is growing up and down, the secondary tissues is what increases the diameter of the plant. So if we look at a cross section here, the plants increase their diameter from this meristem here, okay, from the vascular cambium where the phloem, the secondary phloem is produced to the outside of the cambium and then the xylem is produced on the inside. So we're growing the plant primarily, primary growth is up and down. And remember, once the plant is established, there's not only that one single apical meristem, but then as the shoots start to grow out, they each one have a meristem. So we're still growing up. And then, of course, in plants that are woody plants, they can uh, keep increasing their diameter. Now, seed development is something that you, and I actually had a course in seed development. Uh, we start with a single cell zygote to produce an embryo which finally produces a seed. And at maturity, the seed basically contains everything to make the new plant except for water, minerals, and at some point light. Uh, if the conditions are favorable for germination. So we have all sorts of, uh, I'll cover some of these, we have all sorts of germination inhibiting mechanisms to make, keep seeds dormant so they don't germinate when they shouldn't germinate. And if we go back from seed development to the beginning, we, we are talking about, of course, the flower if we look at a real, at a, and you probably all know these different por portions of, of the flowers, there's different kinds of flowers. The female gametophyte basically is the stigma style in the ovary, and the ovary is where the seeds are going to develop, where the fertilization is going to occur. The ovary may contain more than one ovule. And in each one of these, there's this one fairly large cell called the megaspore mom cell. And then one of these megaspore cells undergoes meiosis, reduction division, to produce a very, very specific uh, ovule. And what you have then, before fertilization, is from one megaspore mom cell, you develop these egg cell, and then the polar nuclei, and then these others, these synergies, don't worry about the names of these. So here you have what will develop into the seed. The integuments then become the seed coats, different, different, kind, different kinds of seeds are gonna have different layers of integuments. You know, so you've got the peanut with the peanut uh, that the, the skin, the little brown thing that surrounds what the true embryo is, the polar nuclei, 
will develop into the endosperm. So this is liquid. And then you have these cells here, these differentiated cells, and uh, the antipodals and the synergies. And then if we take this into one specific, uh, even after fertilization, uh, this is just nuclei floating around in here. And so when you take a coconut and open a coconut, the liquid that's in the coconut is uh, a bunch of nuclei floating around in, in that liquid, that very rich liquid. Okay? You probably know that the male is produced by the stamens. So we have the pollen being produced here. And then we have the same basic process of meiosis and uh, to develop the pollen grain. And here shows you a mature pollen that's being, that is uh, uh, germinating. And inside it has usually three nuclei, a sperm, sometimes two sperm nuclei, and a tube nucleus. And then this pollen tube grows down to the ovule. So the pollen tube is going to grow from, going to go way down around here. And when the pollen tube, and you don't need to know this, but when the pollen tube gets close, one of these synergies actually breaks down. And the pollen tube then grows into to fertilize the egg cell. Okay? So now you've got this same structure with a fertilized egg cell and the other t uh, pollen nuclei goes and fuses with the polar nuclei, okay? With the first division, so at this first division of the egg cell or the fertilized cell, it's polar. And I think we talked about polar divisions maybe the first or second lecture. And even at that point then, when this divides, the nucleus and most of the cytoplasm is in the upper cell, and the lower cell uh, becomes a suspensor. So when it's really early in development, you've got after the first division, you have basically just random divisions in what will develop into the embryo. So it's first it's a sort of a round globular stage. And then that other cell divides and pushes the embryo up. And in this case, this would be becoming cellular. So the embryo is pushed into this very rich tissue. It's triploid, 3N. It's producing a lot of stuff, and that, that pro provides the nourishment for the embryo. Then later, we go into these different stages. You start seeing what will become the cotyledons differentiate. And then depending on the kind of embryo, then you'll see the elongation of the cotyledons and the establishment of vascular tissue of the meristems so that when the seed, and for the most part, when the seed is mature and the embryo is mature, you've got a plant inside there. You already have vascular tissue, the meristems have already been established, and the cotyledons have already been established. Again, now this can vary. This is true for almost all seeds, that you have some kind of mature seed inside. Now there's some, there are different kinds of seeds. Some seeds at maturity have an endosperm. So in these seeds, you've got the big seed and the real tiny embryo, and then endosperm. In other seeds, the endosperm is completely absorbed by the cotyledons. So again, go back to the peanut. If you take the peanut, the two halves are actually the cotyledon. They don't have any endosperm. And when you take the two halves of the peanut and look at that little tiny small thing at the bottom, that's the embryo proper. Okay. Um, there are other seeds at maturity where the embryo, the entire embryo is small and it still has an endosperm. Okay. In monocots, we talked about this before, 
uh, is that you have the endosperm surrounded by that one aluron layer, which produces the uh, enzymes needed for, the, for breakdown, the GA. And they're surrounded by these integuments. So here's the monocot where you have the embryo proper, and then you have the endosperm, and then, of course, the seed coat. Okay? And here's a nice picture of the embryo here. So during germination, if you remember then, this one single cell layer here produces alpha amylase, which breaks the starch down in the embryo to feed the growing in embryo. I mean, in the endosperm to feed the growing embryo. Okay? Now, let's look at an overview of what's going on in terms of hormones. Cytokinins are needed for cell division. Then we have a higher uh, level of GA and IAA, and, uh, so gibberellic acid and auxins. Then later on, we have what a lot of people call the anti-hormone, abscisic acid, which basically then causes, helps, causes the thing to become mature, and water level is reduced dra uh, drastically. And then for a seed, then we go into this quiescent period. So think about this. You've got this living thing that can have a water potential of minus 2,000 bars. Has no water. And then during this period, you know, the seed can go for a long time. Now, what's the oldest seed? You've heard about this since you were a kid. Seeds are, they find seeds that are, you know, 5,000 years old. No. The oldest seed ever recovered has, that's been actually been able to germinate has been about 500 years old. Uh, these much older seeds that used to be the ones that they were, uh, that recovered usually from tombs were actually introduced during the process of wrapping the stuff up, take it out of the, out of the tomb, whatever. Seeds, a viable seed, I think the oldest viable seed is less than 500 years old. But that's a long time to not do anything and still be able to live. Yes, sir? Wasn't that like one of the, I read, was reading something about um, a magnolia seed in Japan where they planted it and it was like something that was like four or five, like five, you know, four or five, six hundred years old or something like that. And it was a magnolia seed and then they planted it and it had one extra petal on flower. It was like, it was like a six petal uh, plant. I, could be. I know about 500, 600 years. I've not heard about the magnolia. The, when I was a student, seeds were three and four thousand years old that germinated, and that was all tracked down to usually from uh, Egyptian tombs. They were they were getting grain seeds out. Well, the grain seeds were actually in the wrappings. So the, they took the, the wrappings in to wrap the stuff up to take them out of the tombs. So uh, it could be I've not heard of that, but. About five or six hundred. It's not unusual to find seeds that are several hundred years old that will germinate. They, I mean, you have to baby them, and they may not produce a normal seedling, but they do have the ability to germinate. So we have this period here, which can go on and on and on, and then we have the uh, basically the reversal as the water goes into the seeds then the nutrients are going to be used for the growing plant. So remember, I, you know, I say the only thing a plant needs, the only thing a seed needs is water and minerals. Well, really, just to get going, usually the only thing the plant seed needs is water and also the appropriate conditions so that it will actually germinate. It has a source of minerals. It's got, it's got if you, as you guys know, phytic acid. It's got all sorts of stored minerals. And so it can go quite a while without anything, but then it eventually is going to need light to continue growing. And then when we transition from seed to plant, then the plant's going to, of course, then need minerals. But it can go quite a while without anything. Now, uh, this period of quiescence can be broke by several different 
mechanisms. First, water, uh, oxygen, the right temperature. And like I said, this seed is up to a minus 2,000 bars. And we talked about this briefly when we talked about water potential, is that the during seed germination, this matrix potential or matrix forces become important. The seed is so dry that they can that it can absorb water from the air. And that's the reason why you can't keep seeds in the south or in this part of the country very long. Because even in air conditioning, air conditioning is much better, but the humidity levels are usually so high that the seed can take up just enough water to get going, not to germinate, just enough water to get going and die. So uh, we have to really worry about temperature and, and humidity. And in, on the fifth floor, we have a seed room, uh, which usually doesn't work. Uh, it's hard to control. You have, it's a rule of 50, 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% humidity. So if you go to the seed, I don't even know where the foundation seed is. I think it's still on campus. All the seeds have to be stored in these very, very elaborate growth chambers. It's hard to control humidity. Humidity is extremely hard to control. Temperature not, but humidity and temperature together is needed. When I did my postdoc in Washington State, the state seed testing lab was the next floor up. They just put the seeds in the, in the cabinets. The humidity was so low, they didn't need any special storage con, uh, conditions. So when they first then we had the matrix forces, we have imbibitional pressure. And you've probably seen this. This is where, you know, I think I've told you before, you can take uh, dry seeds and put them in plaster of Paris. And then the seeds will absorb the water. The plaster will start drying out. The seeds will start absorbing water, and they'll, they'll blow up the plaster. They'll start cracking the plaster of Paris. And you may have seen, you know, there's YouTubes where you can put a seed in a crack, like a cement crack, and, and add water to it, and it'll actually increase the size of the crack. It's a lot of pressure there. Okay, there can be all sorts of conditions that seeds need. Sclerification. Uh, there are actually seven types, seven true types of seed dormancy that seeds can have. And seed dormancy is when you give seed ideal conditions and it doesn't germinate. So you may have to break the seed. Uh, commercially, a lot of times they can do that by taking the seeds and shooting them uh, in an air column at really fast speeds into uh, sandpaper and the, the sandpaper hits the side of the seed enough to break it just to crack through the, the seed coat. Some seeds may need high oxygen uh, so you can overcome dormancy with high oxygen. A lot of times seeds just need to be exposed to the environment long enough to leach out inhibitors. Uh, stratification is, is a unique method of overcoming seed, not really dormancy, because the stratification, you're usually talking about embryo growth a bit. And stratification, what we usually do that, or you can do that in the bottom of your refrigerator, but you have to put the seeds in water. The seeds have to be damp for stratification to work. One that we cannot overcome is immature embryo, and that is when the seed is mature, the embryo is still, still very, very immature, and this, a lot of this is sometimes stratification. We can't overcome an immature embryo because if it's not a mature embryo, it won't develop into a plant. So we can do things to speed this up, and then some seeds need light. Okay. Classic experiment when I taught plant phys lab was the was to do light germination. Uh, you can get lettuce seed. They have, we'll talk about phytochrome, there's red light, and there's far red light. Uh, very few seeds that we, very few crop seeds respond to light anymore that's been bred out. So if I go get some lettuce seeds, they do not respond to light. So for me to do that experiment now, I have to order the seeds from a scientific supply house where they've maintained those varieties that actually need light to germinate. So uh, 
for the most part, if it's a crop, that, that's, that, the light requirements are, are very minimal now. Then, okay, uh, germination ends when the actual radical emerges. So when the first little bit of the root comes out, uh, that is, from a seed physi physiology standpoint, the end of germination. So we can look at these different kinds of plants that we see. And from here to here, then you've got most of the initials for the plant. So from here to here, then, even after this thing's just a little bit taller, we're either going to, we can actually find cells that are already faded to be the ear, or to be the tassel, or to be other parts of the plant. Uh, here's just another shot of germination. These are some cucumber seeds coming up. And when they get to this point, then they'll start blowing off the seed coat and germinating. I want to just finish up with a couple of slides I put in here about seed vigor. Uh, this is uh, something that's very important to crops. And a high vigor seed is going to germinate under normally encountered conditions. So what, what is normally encountered conditions? anything now, uh, flooding. So a seed, if it has high seed vigor, should be able to withstand a few days of flooding or a few days of cold weather. It's very hard to measure. Uh, I put this in, actually I put this in from, uh, this is a classic test that we do with corn. On the left is, what is the sweet corn when you germinate it at 25 degrees C. If you take that exact same batch of corn and germinate it at 15 degrees C, this is what you get. So sweet corn doesn't germinate very well. So what we try to come up with is some kind of lab test that will predict how it will perform in the real world. So if we germinate these in the lab, looks great. But if we take these and grow them in the field, they don't germinate well but we can, in the lab, duplicate the field conditions by lowering the temperature. And I have in my office now, they're online, uh, three books that are probably nine inches thick total that are all the official ways that you have to test a seed. So if it's a given species of seed, there's an official way that you have to test that seed to see whether or not it will germinate or not. Uh, not just for crop plants, but for plants all over the world. And that will tell you then, that will give you some idea about how that test, how that seed will perform in the field. Because I can tell you, if I go out in the field and I pull, and someone says, my seeds didn't germinate, and you dig them out and say, no, there's a radical, they germinate just fine, well, you're probably going to get hit. Because the farmer doesn't really care about seed germination. They count about, they, they're worried about not just stand establishment, but they also want all the seeds when they germinate to germinate on the same day and that all the plants will be the same height. Okay? And we're over time. I'm going to stop there. Questions? Okay.